Bonjour les amis, alors aujourd'hui une vidéo qui me paraît très importante parce que d'une simplicité enfantine et il semblerait que être déshydraté risque de mortalité trois fois plus élevé dans le cancer. Alors cette dame nous explique toutes les recherches, nous explique ce qu'elle a fait. Je vous mets comme d'habitude, cette vidéo traduite en français et en grand, de manière à ce que vous puissiez lire, même sur un petit téléphone. Water. We all know how essential it is, and yet we often struggle to drink enough of it. The ease with which we can forget about water is something that 2024-25 U.S. Fulbright scholar Jody Stuckey has observed not just in the general populace, but in scientific research and the data it produces as well. This program year, she came to Salzburg to dive deeper into water and to close the gap in data on the effects water can have on cancer cells. I've been in Salzburg at the Paracelsus Medical University since September, so about four months, and we were doing various projects, and one of them is to set up a new randomized control trial, probably to launch next summer, maybe next fall, and the idea is to replicate a project that I did 12 years ago in, uh, in healthy young men, five healthy young men. It's very exciting, but when you have only five people, people are like, well, but it was only five people. So this project, we're going to increase the sample size, introduce women, and try and see if, we, if these results are replicable. And what exactly was that study about? The reason I did this study is looking for biomarker so that we can tell if someone is hydrated or not hydrated. So the idea was to take people who don't you know, usually have a lot of water to drink. And these people reported two liters total. So all their beverages and their food totally added up to two liters a day. We asked them to come in and keep eating and drinking what you normally do and add a liter of water and keep doing that for two weeks. And after two weeks, ask them to add another liter. So it was two liters on top of what they came in. So over four weeks, they were over a liter higher than what they started out with. They've really changed their hydration. And, and over the 10 years since then, I have been gradually analyzing the data that we had stored in the freezer from, from the study. Drinking plenty of water to keep our bodies hydrated is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. But how does our water consumption factor into cancer research? We're talking about people not thinking about drinking water when they're working on cancer research or treating cancer patients or thinking about cancer risk factors. For example, when you go to the WHO website to get information about cancer, it will list various risk factors like smoking and alcohol and diet, but it doesn't mention water or hydration. And what's sad about that is that hydration, drinking water may be important at various different stages, like who's going to get the cancer and it, it will potentially protect you from getting it in the first place. If the cells get damaged, Then there's another tier down where the body can, can de defend itself and kill off the cells and water can be involved in that process. Water is involved in the cells my, once they're damaged, migrating to other parts of the body. That's part important part. If you're very sick, it's involved in how well the treatments work. That will be a modify the effect of the drugs. And then you get all the way there, you're hospitalized, it's not looking good. And then we have data from the hospitals showing that If you're dehydrated, your mortality risk is three times higher. So it's related in all these ways and all these different levels in the cells. Breast cancer is the reason that Jody has focused on water and hydration epidemiology for more than 30 years. And it all started for one simple reason. She was thirsty. In 1993, I was doing a master's degree in nutrition in Sheffield, England at the University of Sheffield. And uh, there, our homework that week was to summarize all the diet risk factors for cancer, protective ones and adverse risk factors. And I was doing, you know, what normally all the other students were doing, go out and have the fish and chips and the beer and the 
drink tea and I was very thirsty, many days chronically thirsty and waking up at night so thirsty and dreaming about water. And the next day I sat down to do my work and realized, hmm, these risk factors for cancer, the smoking, the salt, the alcohol, these things are dehydrating or they're increasing the water requirements. And the protective factors, the fruit, the vegetables, the yogurt, they're hydrating, they're wet. So I went to the literature to say, you know, well, what is it? Is water there too? Is that one of the risk factors I should include in my homework assignment? And I found nothing. And so I sort of fell in love with the topic at that point and went and talked to my advisor at the time. And we convinced her to do a breast cancer case control study. And we found in that study that the, the controls were five times more likely to drink water than the breast cancer cases. And so that was kind of the start of my interest in drinking water effects on chronic disease risk. 30 years after her interest was sparked, Jody received a Fulbright grant to work on her current project in Salzburg. While Jody's focus is on big data sets, her grant allowed her to collaborate with a colleague whose focus is on something much smaller. I'm an epidemiologist. My training is in large data sets, analyzing large data sets, nutrition survey data, with an idea of like, what's the prevalence of cancer, you know, and what, are, what is the population eating, and then using that kind of data points to influence and inform public health policy at the population national level, international level, in order to use the data to change, to do interventions or change policy, it has to be meet a certain level of causality. And, you, and part of that is having a mechanism to explain why this variable is related to that variable. And so for the past 15 years, I've been looking for literature about mechanisms. I started to meet people who know about cell hydration. And Marcus Ritter is one of the world experts on that. And so I've come to work with him to kind of link what they know about the mechanisms at the cell level with what we, what we can tell people about drinking water. In the labs at the PMU Institute, led by Marcus Ritter, the cell-related research is well established. Uh, I've been working on, on these topics for more than 20 years now. Started in Innsbruck together with uh, my boss, Marcus Ritter. We worked on uh, special ion channels involved in cell volume regulation, mainly uh, swelling sensitive, volume sensitive chloride channels and in how far they affect volume regulation, how this can be affected. And so this started in Innsbruck in the late 1990s and went on then here in Salzburg where we built up this institute and continued our work on chloride channel cell volume regulation, pH regulation, and in how far these mechanisms affect, for example, uh, cell proliferation, cell migration, phagocytosis of, of uh, cells, and so on. Both in Jody's specific project at PMU and more broadly in cell-related research, water is an essential factor. During all my research we have done over the last 20 years, water always has been an integral part of these scientific questions because whenever particles move, chloride moves, other ions move, uh, water is affected by that at, as it's osmotically uh, attracted by the movement of uh, salts and uh, dissolved substances. So these processes of ion transport, electrolyte transport and water transport uh, are uh, fully inter interlinked and in connection one to each other. In this study, what we see is, is a switch in the pattern of metabolites. This basically, it's consistent with Marcus Ritter and Martin Jacob. They know that when the cell shrinks, it's a metabolic switch. They see that at the cell level. And so to be able to see the same switch in the whole body, the whole person, after they've been drinking water and really changed their hydration for four weeks, then you see a whole bunch of different metabolic pathways turned on and turned off. So the red pathways were increased and the blue pathways were decreased. And so you can see a change in the vitamin A, the, the redox is the oxidative stress, the protein metabolism. We hydrated, so we saw less protein breakdown. It's characteristic to see more protein breakdown with diabetes, with cancer, these age-related chronic diseases. The reason that this is so exciting for me 
uh, as an epidemiologist working in healthy young people to see this switch that parallels what they see in cells. It's really cool because the, the zoologists and the biologists, they know about a pattern that looks just like this that's called estivation. When there's drought conditions, the various plants and the different species do a metabolic switch like this to estivate and wait until the rainy season comes. It's a similar pattern, switching away from estivation. So you see it with the estivation and the drought, and then you see it with the chronic disease. The chronic disease people are reporting a similar pattern. They call it the Warburg pattern. And so that is known to be associated with cancer. I'm really hoping people see these parallels and recognize that it this switch is affecting all these pathways at once. And so when you target one receptor or one pathway and you don't pay attention to these other pathways that are going on also, then how can you expect your drug treatment to be effective? It, it, it would only help to think about hydration. Because so many studies have not controlled for water, it's difficult to say with certainty the exact impact that water can have in terms of preventing or mitigating cancer. But as Jody works to close the data gap, one thing is for sure. Staying hydrated is beneficial, and we should all strive to drink plenty of water each and every day.